For 110 years, the saga of the Titanic's sinking and rediscovery has captured the imagination of people around the world. And today we're honored to host one of the explorers who is literally bringing new light to that saga. Stockton Rush, the president and chief submersible pilot at Ocean Gate Expeditions, will take you through the process of constructing the world's first carbon fiber, human-occupied submersible, creating a successful deep sea exploration company that leverages support from citizen scientists and diving repeatedly to the Titanic. So stand by for a behind the scenes look at the latest Titanic expedition and at how Ocean Gate's business model can serve the interests of science and history while respecting the bottom line as well. Stockton, Uh, 13 years ago when I founded this business, uh, I've run into a lot of journalists and uh, Alan is the, the best uh, I've ever run into. So if you ever get a chance to be interviewed by Alan, definitely do it. Now yeah, we'll see if this works. Nope. There we go. Um, I bring this up, you know, it, the Earth is really a water planet. I think we we'll probably all appreciate that. But I also uh, was a space person. And uh, half our uh, mission specialist clients who go to the Titanic have either been to space or are going to space. One of the reasons I started the business was I didn't understand why we were spending 1,000 times as much money to explore space as we were to explore uh, Earth and the oceans. Uh, sorry, the oceans. Um, and NASA has come out repeatedly now uh, talking about the fact that there are more aquatic, it's more liquid water in the solar system than they imagined. That many things, Pluto as well as moons of Jupiter and Saturn, have liquid oceans uh, capped over. And the belief is that there's far more aquatic life in our solar system and in the universe. And I didn't understand why we weren't exploring it. And part of that gets down to the media, and I'll come back to this, which is appreciated that um, people are all about emotion. And we've had such amazing movies about space and not as many about the ocean. The ocean is a scary spot. And because of that, I think, is one of the big things. And what I wanted to do with the business was just move the needle, get people excited about the ocean, explore the ocean, and discover what was, what was out there. So this will be about the only tech slide I have. A lot of facts. We all get the three quarters of the planet is water, but that's really uh, deceiving. It's actually 98% of the livable volume. So if you think about livable volume, you have uh, you know, on the surface from the earth to the, uh, the dirt to the top of the trees. In the ocean, it's the full depth. Uh, people don't appreciate the average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters. And yet there are only a handful of subs, I think about five subs, most are owned by governments, run by research institutions. Uh, there is no private access to the deep ocean. And yet, there's all this life to be discovered. And as we go down to the Titanic, it's amazing the creatures we see on the two and a half hour descent, the most bizarre things uh, you can imagine. So uh, in uh, 2010, we formed the business. And uh, the first thing we did was we bought the sub in the upper left called Antipodes. And this was our training sub. Uh, it had been a uh, tourist sub in the South Island of New Zealand. We used that to take everyone from uh, journalists to venture capitalists to lay people to Macklemore, you name it. We took them in the sub to try to figure out, OK, what is the business model here? We thought that there was this opportunity, there was this need for people to go in the ocean. There were researchers who wanted to go in the ocean. Robots, autonomous vehicles had their place, but there was a spot for humans to go down there, more so even than there's a reason for humans to go to space. Um, but what was the model there? And we thought, well, there are folks who want to do high-end adventure tourism, people who were going, uh, spending $100,000 to climb Everest or to go to Antarctica. Maybe we could merge the two. So we got that, and we dove all over the place. We dove in oh, Alcatraz Island, uh, Monterey, Gulf of Mexico, you name it. We went around. And then in 2015, we launched the Cyclops Project, which generated the uh, minimum viable prototype on the lower left, which I strongly recommend, as would most folks. Uh, we just got it out there to figure out what we could do. It can only go only to 1,600 feet. Um, the Titanic is 12,500 feet deep. But it helped us uh, build out the business model, get awareness, work on our launch and recovery system, which we'll talk about a little bit. And ultimately, in 2017, we dove Titan, which is the, uh, the queen of the fleet. We have five subs. Uh, one goes to 1,000 feet, one goes to 1,600 feet, and Titan goes to 13,200 feet deep. 
done a bunch of ex uh, expeditions and learned that there are many challenges. There's the uh, technology challenge. There is the, um, there's a regulatory challenge. There are a bunch of things to do, but those expeditions have really helped us uh, hone our skills. Uh, this is the Atlantis, the sister ship of the Tommy Thompson, which is uh, based out of uh, University of Washington. It's the mothership for uh, Alvin, and that's the typical approach. These research subs that are out there were never meant to make money. They were never meant to be cost effective. They were meant to do cool stuff, get lots of samples, go deep, and they all require these huge ships that are very expensive, particularly when you're not using them, which is most of the time. What we found after researching the market was that there had been a technology used at the University of Hawaii uh, where they got away from the big ship by um, disconnecting the launch and recovery uh, from the ship and towing the submarine out on a platform that would then sink underwater and be able to be launched off that, go do its mission, come back, come to the surface. And you could tow it back and forth. You could move the people with a Zodiac, so you had a soft-sided light vessel going back and forth. Because the challenge in the open ocean is operating in uh, high sea states, big waves. Uh, anybody can do it in the calm of a harbor. It's really tough when you've got 10 and 15 foot waves. The other challenge was all the subs were three person subs. And we found after the first few dives, I'd go down and I'd be cruising around in Puget Sound and somebody say, hey, that's a, what's that fish? And I said, I don't know, I just make subs. Um, <laughs> When you get a researcher down there who just gets passionate about the fish or the crabs or the, the shipwreck that you're on, that permeates the sub. It's, it's a must have. It's like going to a museum with no labels and no guide. It's night and day. So we said, okay, you gotta have a pilot. You gotta have a, what we call a subject matter expert. And then you don't do the coolest thing you're ever gonna do in your life by yourself. You take your wife, your son, your daughter, your best friend, and you, that's, so you gotta have four people. All the subs out there were either two or three person subs. Um, and then you also needed to have enough uh, depth of field that you could tell a story behind the sub. So um, that, the cylinders are I mean, a, a sphere is a great thing for pressure. It's a terrible thing to live in. And if you look at videos that are done in subs, bubble subs or whatever, they typically are shots outside that could have been scuba diving shots or robot shots or selfies because you can't get enough depth of field. With a cylinder shape, you can have a, a producer, a director, a cameraman, you can have the talent in the dome. It just totally changes it. And we, we practice with things like fixed seating. Uh, and now we just have sort of an open bay. It's a very uh, participatory activity when you come in the sub. So to do this, we had to uh, use a different material. Um, titanium is the common. There's some, some high strength uh, carbon steels that are used. I think the Russians use those. But uh, titanium uh, is, um, let's put it this way, carbon fiber is three times better on a strength to buoyancy basis than titanium. And underwater, that's what you care about. It's not strength to weight, it's strength to buoyancy. And yet no one had done that. And there are uh, certifying or semi-certifying agencies, the uh, Pressure Vessels for Human Occupation Committee that uh, handles hyperbaric chambers and submarines. You have the SubSafe program in the, uh, in the Navy. These programs are uh, over the top in their rules and regulations, but they had nothing with carbon fiber. So we had to go out and, uh, and work on that. And one of the things I learned is, you know, when you're outside the box, it's really hard to tell how far outside the box you really are. Uh, and we were pretty far out there. So we have a, a carbon fiber hull, it's five inches thick, uh, and titanium uh, domes on the end. One of the things that uh, I think a lot of people appreciate is if you're not breaking things, you're not innovating. Uh, if you're operating within a known environment, um, as most submersible manufacturers do, they don't break things. Uh, Woods Hole uh, does a lot of autonomous things. They have a whole wall of stuff they've broken. To me, the more stuff you've broken, the more innovative you've been. And this is a third scale model that we took to the chamber at the University of Washington and took it to destruction. Uh, and once you go over 6,000 PSI, uh, in the Ocean Sciences Building, you can only do that at night, and then they get on the loudspeaker and they tell everybody to get out. And now I'm standing next to this chamber and we blow this thing up. It's the loudest thing I've ever heard. It shook the whole building, blew out all the pressure sensors, which I had to rebuy for the university. Um, but it helps us validate an acoustic monitoring system because in the research found out that with composites, what you really want is acoustic monitoring. Strain gauges don't tell you a lot because they just tell you the deformation on the inner surface. When you're dealing with composites, uh, acoustics will pop and crackle and it's almost like having an EKG. You can tell how the hull is doing and if we were going to stretch this new material in a new environment with people inside, we needed to know well before it failed that it failed. 
Our rule is we risk capital, we don't risk people. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, here's a new idea for the, the sub, if the, uh, the end result of that failing is that we cancel a mission or we lose a little money, that's fine. If somebody gets hurt, then we go and find out a, a different approach. And with the acoustic monitoring system, we can tell if the hull has had some problem over time. Maybe uh, it was run into by a forklift and we didn't know it or dropped in its transport on its way to the East Coast. Um, because the pressure and temperature at 1,000 meters and 2,000 meters and 3,000 meters is always the same. And so if it's making noises at that depth that it didn't make on the last dive, then we can stop the dive, we can go up, and we can find out what might have happened. Um, we made one hull. Uh, I took it to 4,000 meters, um, uh, and it made a lot of noise, which is a very sphincter-tightening experience. Um, <laughs> We brought it back, and it wasn't getting quieter on the second dive. It should have been dramatically quieter. If you think about it, when you get to this uh, maximum pressure, it's a thing called the Kaiser effect, you get a lot of popping and crackling. And the next time you go to that pressure, you should have a lot less. All those weak fibers and voids have all been taken care of. And this hull wasn't doing it. So we scrapped it. We went back. We built another one. The first one we had done was with a uh, highly recommended uh, marine manufacturer. We went to aerospace quality. We use the same uh, prepreg that's used on the 787 with our partners, and we couldn't have done any of this without partners, uh, great partner in Electro Impact up in Everett. Great to be in this community where there is such a um, preponderance of expertise in titanium and carbon fiber and manufacturing and engineering. We did work with Janicke, Boeing, NASA. There's 667 layers of carbon fiber uh, in just a, what's called a 090 uh, axial and um, um, uh, rotational uh, layup, which is not normally done, but in the ocean, that's all you see. You don't get any torsional moments. We built this hull up. We um, were, uh, tested it at the Deep Ocean Test Facility in Annapolis, Maryland, an amazing uh, facility, the only one on the planet where you can put something like that in a, for a test. And then in 2021, after having to cancel twice before, we were able to go out and dive on the Titanic. The challenges that we've run into in uh, regulatory transportation, we're shipping containers across country, across international boundaries during the pandemic. We got all of our mission specialists in with much difficulty uh, and we're able to do some dives, capture some amazing footage uh, and then went back this last year uh, and actually brought an 8K camera because we have this gigantic dome. You can see the mission specialists have their, their iPhones in there capturing great images. We get great images on the outside. Um, and one of the things I really liked was on the last dive of the last mission this year, we had one extra dive. So when we go out, we are out on, we're over the Titanic for five days. We have to do two dives to um, fulfill what we've told our uh, mission specialist clients uh, if they're going to get to the Titanic. We've got five days to do that. We were weathered out on every cycle. We only got the two dives that we needed to get. On the last day, the last dive, we had one extra one, and we dove on a, a target that was uh, a sonar target from 25 years prior, thought it might be a shipwreck. It turned out to be a subsea reef, uh, 10,000 feet underwater, and it had all these sponges and soft corals. Uh, you can see the two green dots there. Those are uh, 10 centimeters, four inches apart. So these are fairly large structures, and we'll be, you know, have a press release and we're submitting some papers on this amazing um, oasis of biodiversity in the abyssal plains, uh, the, the uh, researchers like to say. It, really incredible. And so what I love doing about going in the sub, every time I dive, I see something I've never seen before that no human has probably ever seen before. This is when you're, if you weren't on this uh, reef, it's just mud with occasional rocks that get dropped by icebergs coming south. So as icebergs come down and melt, they'll drop these bombs of rocks and then over the years, uh, maybe a coral will grow on it here and there. But this thing was incredible. It was 20 meters high, 100 meters long, and, uh, and totally unknown and undiscovered. I come back to the media part of this. If I'm going to change our awareness of the ocean, it really is going to come through the media. And we had, um, we do a lot with video. Uh, we had some great 4K video that we put out last year. When we launch something on YouTube, we typically 10, 20,000 views is considered pretty good. Uh, this year, we, had, uh, we launched a, a video that got to a million views after two months. We go, wow, that's great. And then three weeks ago, we launched a video of our 8K, and it went to four million views in two weeks. And I don't know if you've had viral videos, but it's really sort of a fun feeling. You wake up in the morning, you want to see how many more people. It's very addictive. 
Um, but what we're doing with the 8K and the 4K is to try to make this uh, more accessible for, for the folks who can't afford the $250,000 that, that it costs to go with us on the dive. But what we want to do is do immersive exhibits like the Van Gogh and other immersive exhibits that are very popular so that you can go out and see an image of the Titanic as it was just a few months ago or over the period of years as we go back year after year in photorealistic three-story high image. Uh, I think that's going to be very compelling. We're also working on streaming series and uh, BBC will have a piece coming out actually tonight on, on our expedition. But that's really how we're going to change how people perceive the ocean, at least in my opinion, and hopefully get us spending as much time and money and attention to the ocean as we do to space. Uh, I think space is wonderful, but I'm a little more prone to think that, that the ocean is, is really right now the critical thing we've got to understand. Climate change, how, we, how the planet responds to climate change, it's all in the ocean and we know almost nothing. Um, so I'm really excited to do that and then thank you again for, for having me here. And, been great to present what we do. Great presentation. Yeah. I just had a quick question. If you could go and explore anything in the sea, I mean, there are a number of shipwrecks out there. Uh, I know the recent discovery of Shackleton's ship, the Endurance, mm -hmm. is an example. What, what ship would you like to go see, or what would you like to go discover? Yes, yeah, so sea? what I want to do is hydrothermal vents. Okay. Um, so for, uh, it's sort of amazing. One of the great discoveries of uh, the last hundred years in the ocean, uh, even on the planet, was this uh, discovery of hydrothermal vents about 30 years ago. So I was brought up saying everything depended on photosynthesis. These vents, they went and found out that in fact there's an entire uh, ecosystems that are based on chemosynthesis. The highest density of biomass on the planet are next to hydrothermal vents. And they do it without the sun all with geothermal energy and the things coming from the planet. So the sun could shut down and there'll still be life down there. Um, so that's, I really want to do that. We're looking to uh, potentially go to the Azores where there's on the mid-continent ridge and there are these vents with uh, two worms that are three feet long and crabs and shrimp and they're all living in this amazing band. And as far as shipwrecks, I'd like to go see the Bismarck. Um, and the Bismarck is about 300 miles off of, uh, off of uh, France. Uh, but it's at 4,800 meters. And right. what's the significance of the Bismarck? Well, the Bismarck is interesting. Like the Titanic, it died on its maiden voyage. Um, it was sunk by the British uh, and the Allies in uh, World War II. And so uh, it sank, and uh, the uh, Russian Mir subs went there um, 30 years ago or so. It landed on a subterranean mountain, so it came down a ski jump. If you think of the Titanic, it came down and splat on the bottom. Yeah. The bow dove into the mud, about uh, uh, 60 feet into the mud, but the stern came flat down and sort of scattered. The, um, the Bismarck hit this hill, and there's a, a half mile uh, slide as it came down the ski jump. And so it's in apparently an amazing condition, huh. except for a few holes from, that the Brits put in it. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's hear it again for Stock and Rush. Thank you. Thank you, Stockton, for being here. Great presentation. Great.